Eh, salve, benvenuti. Eh, L'incontro di oggi con Peter Baradoff è sicuramente Peter, è sicuramente uno degli incontri più interessanti eh, perché eh, eh, ci apre la conoscenza della storia di un archivio glorioso e importantissimo come il Ghost Filmophon. Eh, la storia delle Cineteche è una storia credo abbastanza straordinaria, le cineteche nascono due anni prima dello scoppio della seconda guerra mondiale, in quel momento cineteche di quattro paesi diversi, Germania, Francia, Inghilterra e Stati Uniti, che sarebbero stati avversari due anni dopo in guerra, decidono di mettersi insieme e quest'unione attraversa la seconda guerra mondiale e attraversa la guerra fredda. E, mh, è come se gli archivisti, eh, più che appartenere alla loro nazione, appartenessero al cinema eh, e che la nazionalità degli archivisti fosse piuttosto quella cinematografica. E, mh, e la storia di Gosselin Lafont è, è davvero una storia importante, un archivio che ha un straordinario patrimonio. Eh, e senza il lavoro di Gosselino Fon eh, saremmo tutti molto, molto più poveri. Grazie a Peter Badroff che ci racconterà questa storia. Grazie, thank you, thank you Gianluca. È un piacere essere qui e sono un po' nervoso perché è un caso molto difficile per me. Because unlike Amin Angua, or Lindgren, or Iris Berry, Mitri had died just a few years ago. And uh, he is still, you know, a part of the family. Not, it, not that it's, it is tragic, but we refer to him every day, uh, mostly joking about him. <laughs> and uh, uh, because for decades he was Mr. Gustavo Fon, or maybe even Mr. Russian cinema for the entire world. Although he was never officially the director of the archive, which is a paradox. Uh, had different positions, but um, he was responsible for bringing Russian film to the world in many senses, and he was definitely responsible for bringing world cinema to Russia. But he was not the one who found that Gustavo Fon, so before we switch to him, I'd like to say a few words about the others. Uh, so I'm sorry to start with the name of Stalin. I would not like to admit it, but he is the one responsible for the founding of our archive. However, we may not be happy about this, because he was a great fan of cinema. He didn't understand much about music, nor about theater, definitely nothing about poetry, but he was a great, I would say we call a sir of film. He was watching films every single day for three, four hours, the right records, year after year, with very few exceptions. And uh, so he saw practically every film that was released in the Soviet Union from the early 30s until his death in 1953. And in fact, he was responsible, of course, for the release of those films or for them being shelved, as we say. His favorite film was a 1934, well, biopic slash action slash drama slash comedy, Chafayev. By the Vasily brothers, which is really one of the masterpieces of Soviet cinema. It is not as well appreciated in the West as it was in Russia for many reasons, not political, just you know, language matters a lot, things like this. But in the course of one year, he has watched this film 34 times. Um, so it was a rare case when uh, the main character in a rather optimistic film dies at the end, and the kids were always searching for this one unique print where he finally is alive, where he swims out of this river, which never happened. Um, so the negative, they were making new prints, not only for Stalin, of course, but for the entire country. The negative was uh, being damaged constantly, and Stalin was uh, aware of that. So in December 1935, 35, he issued a decree about the organization of a so we say negative collection, negative storage, maybe. And I can quote directly, to keep a negative of Chapayev, this specific, very film, this very film, 
in a special safe. Along with documentaries, a documentary for the Chop Lenin and Stalin himself, uh, and eight, only eight other titles. Four feature films, fiction films, uh, the youth of Maxim, Jonas Maxima, by Kosen Sekentauberg, the peasants, Christiani, by Friedrich Adler, uh, the Vrankos, uh, Irogad, and the relatively forgotten film by now, although interesting one, The Last Masquerade, by Sleetney Muscarat, by Mikhail Chiorelli, and a few other documentaries. Um, well, the negative of Chapayev, fortunately, is still there. I read into it about a year ago. It's a miracle how they printed the film, because it's really fun to look at, because every single piece, like every 50 meters, it's a different film stock. Akfa goes to Koda goes to give that to something, to some Russian film store. Anyway, so it is still there. But December 1935 may be the first, well, the starting point of the film of Hong. So in uh, February 1937, a state film storage was founded in a place near Moscow called Belyostolby, which means white pillars, um, white columns. Mm, we even have the sums the amount of currency, so to acquire special safes from abroad, storage lockers, they um, spent $170,000. And Russia did not have much currency, so it was a big issue, it was discussed a lot. Initial staff of eight people that were physically present, because they were planned to have only 20. And before the outburst of the Second World War in Russia, which was 1941, now 39, like everywhere else, uh, there was only one vault with uh, 200 stacks, 200 stacks. Each stack had 40 cells, so it was built for, it could store 8,000 reels. And two more vaults were started. Finished way later, now we have 20. Um, there were several sources of our collection. Uh, one is uh, our film university, Geek, the film school in Moscow which uh, collected films, well, just to show the students, mostly silence, of course. I was lucky enough to know personally a little bit the man who was the first one to collect films in Russia, he lived until 97. He was a very famous professor of foreign film history, Sergei Komarov. Well, the main anecdote about him, many anecdotes, we have much more anecdotes than facts, unfortunately, is that in the early 90s, he was about 87, 88, he would teach a foreign silent film history, European and American. And uh, for the first hour, he would retell a film which he saw 70 years ago, shot by Shelley, wonderful memory. Mm -hmm. and then there would be a break, and then the students would have to watch the same film. <laughs> Knowing it always by heart by this time, he was famous for that. Uh, and as happens many times, many of these historical anecdotes, he ran into some of the film collections of the former distribution offices uh, by accident. One was at an old, um, old convent monastery, which was about to be disposed. Another one was at the distribution office. And so he just collected four students. And he got a medal in Paris at the World Exhibition of 1937 for that. He was very proud of this thing, which he probably should be. Um, so he was, this was the first source, Geek, the film school. And we got their collection in the late well, during the war and the late 40s. Um, a second source, of course, is uh, the film studios. They all had their walls. Because the good thing about those film films was, is that it was a state-run archive. So it was obligatory for all the uh, negative containing, uh, you know, uh, master material containing uh, facilities to, ha to, uh, to hand over the, the material. So all of the film studios sent their negatives and the prints of their negatives to Mr. Mafond. Leningrad, Moscow, all the republics. And uh, it is really well, funny or tragic, for however you think of that, um, the uh, survival status of our collection. Because, for example, the Georgians uh, had a wonderful vault and were probably very good caretakers. So the survival status of Georgian silent films is 100% which is completely remarkable, and they have quite good with films too. Whereas Leningrad, St. Petersburg nowadays, which was one of the main film studios, which has some masterpieces like you know, the New Babylon or the Babylon Empire, 
they had all the film stock, negatives and positive prints, stored in Old Cathedral, which uh, burned down during the war. And so we only had distribution prints, which were later you know, Duke Nag and so there almost no negatives, of, except Chepayev, of films from Leningrad. Uh, there is a legend that actually uh, the Germans screwed the films with them when they left this little place near Leningrad and that the cathedral was empty when it was burning. I hope it, I hope it is true. <laughs> then there's a possibility to find something. So, uh, um, and then of course the distribution offices. Mm, in 1939, the Soviet troops uh, liberated um, Western Ukraine and Belarus, that is, took part of Poland, captured, and so that's how uh, the Russians got a great deal of foreign films of the 30s, the talkies, because there was almost no film distribution in the talking era. In the 20s, there was everything, including avant garde film, abstract film, whatever. And from 1931, a complete list of foreign films shown in Russia is one page long. Uh, we had one film with Betty Davis, and uh, no film with Betty Garbo. So the main foreign star for Russian audience was uh, one of the actors, also Hungarian actress Francisca Gall. We had a remarkable, a huge amount of film with her, three. Um, so 39 was the breaking point when they, for example, got a copy of a film, a musical by Julien Duvivier, an American musical by him, um, The Great Waltz, which is still, for those who are 80, 90 years old, the best film of their life, where they first saw in a real Hollywood musical. Um, and the last major, um, well, uh, I would say, stream of films that came to the cinema font, was the German collection of the Rice Film Archive, which came in 1945 as a war trophy. Um, so, uh, that was the case. During the war, the whole collection of the Silver Front was evacuated to Siberia, to the city of Novosibirsk. It returned in 1945, more or less safely, maybe something was lost, but it's more or less it's still there. And, uh, um, yes. In October 1948, finally, this strange storage, as empty walls, were renamed as a institution called Gostelmofond. Gostelmofond of Russia, and so with official births is 1948, so we are turning uh, 75 and, no, sorry, uh, 17 to a year. Um, by that time, it had uh, 13,000 titles. Now we have about 70,000 titles. And it was rather an Research Institute, then an archive, was supposed to write film histories, to catalog, uh, to analyze film stock. By 1950, the greatest thing possible happened, we got a legal deposit. So from 1950, we have almost every single fiction, fiction film made in Russia. And there was a law at once uh, that for each film produced in Russia and produced by the state, and that is everything, because we had no private film companies, we got negatives, camera negatives, the image and the sound effect, and the sound effect, usually three different films, um, reels, a fine grain, two prints, sound and image, a positive print, a wonderful invention of the Soviet censor, so-called montage list, not exactly a continuity list. When the film was over, it had to be described accurately shot by shot for the censors, so that in case somebody is arrested, for example, Although some bits would be excluded, we would know where to exclude it from. But this is a blessing for all film historians. So if there is an incomplete film, we know exactly what is missing. And so that's what that started in 1932 approximately. And so this montage list are wonderful, completely marvelous. Maybe the only good thing that the Soviet censorship uh, did to cinema. Um, so this uh, big collection of uh, all master materials and papers and different acts and uh, technical documentary this was all had to be stored with the film and later on also posters publicity stills so uh, I would say that our collection of films made from 1950 to 1991 is quite remarkable almost complete there are few exceptions it is of course more complicated with the silent era um, so I will just give some dates and then I will go to personalities since 1961, Gustav Mofont was releasing catalogs and books, sometimes very good ones. 
In 1955, a great event happened because the first foreigner visited Brazil for the first time, and that was uh, Wolfgang Klauer, the future head of the uh, GDR Film Archive and the future Fiat president. He was very was in his early 20s back like then, just as an exchange program. And I guess this visit influenced a lot the first record of Brazilian conflict privato, which is where? Far away, but anyway. Jumping back and forth. Yeah. The first record of the Southern Fund, uh, Victor Privato, uh, was in 1957, the Fund joined Fiat. And being one of the major archives in the world, you know, at a certain point we even have been in the, in, in the Guinness Book of Records, although it's impossible to tell which archive has the largest collection, and it's stupid to really talk about this. But uh, was, was taken uh, as one of the founding members, although Fiat was rather old by that time. And Privato became one of the vice presidents. Not being too active in Fiat, to be quite frank, because he did not speak any language except Russian. But he was the first to open this entirely new world to European and American archives. And this was acknowledged, obviously. Um, in, uh, so from 58, an active, a very active exchange between the Fiat members launches between Russia and other countries. So that's when we are starting to get foreign films. Finally, after a big gap, and that's when Russian films start to flow into Europe and America and then later Asia and all the other continents. Uh, there were two congresses for Fiat in Moscow, 64 and 73, quite a long time ago, and they were all very big events for all the people because the first time when was a big, a really big, large amount of foreign filmmakers. The first since 1935, when we had our first and only film festival during Stalin's era. Um, so at the moment we're having, we have 20 volts, 70,000 titles approximately, about a million cans. A film festival, an archival film festival, that started in 1997. And that's more or less all the statistics. Um, can we show the very first uh, clip, please? So this is the first, uh, it's a documentary made about the Stelfon in 1960. And that start, sorry, it's going to be technically a bit complicated. From uh, minute one, so one minute 45 seconds. That's the starting point. Just so you would see uh, the facility, how it looked 55 years ago. documentary made for television 1960. Well, Privato was still the director. He was a director for the first 33 years, quite a long time. Maybe the best one we have. So while the video is being opened, I'll tell a little bit more about him. He was working in film distribution uh, as an administrator in different provincial towns. Sometimes he uh, went from cinema to other art. He was a director of a circus for some time. He was not an archivist. He didn't really understand a lot about archive, but he was smart enough to open the boundaries, to lead uh, the cinema font into Fiat, and uh, to take a very, very young Vladimir Dmitriev, who would be the hero of my presentation, and to give him lots of freedom at the age of 25, to basically make him the well, the face of Fiat, although he had no formal power. So, although he did not watch a single restoration, didn't know film history, he did a great deal. Because for a Soviet official who started his career in, in Stalin's day, this was quite remarkable. And so he was very much loved by everyone. Although when we talks about film history, <laughs> okay. Yes, I start from here. Well, it had a stupid Russian voiceover, so... So this is the first building of the archive, which we still have. Built before the war. Looks more like a lab than like a college institution. With the pictures of the, of the main filmmakers, of course, which are Eisenstein, Podolkin, and I suppose the Drenko. Um, yes, of course, Drenko. Yeah. And Gerasimov and one of the Vasilian brothers. Mm. So look at the woman at the back. 
that uh, we'll see more, talk more about her, that's Vera Hanjonkova, the wife of the legendary Russian producer, who may produce all the film by Penny Bauer and others. Here she is, identifying an early Russian film at the age of about 70. Okay, let's, let's stop here, please. Let's make a pause here, but don't turn it off, because then we'll return back. Um, so there are a few people which have to be mentioned. Well, maybe we could have a little less light because it's not really clearly visible. Uh, uh, and uh, would you please make, make a pause of the video so we wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't play while I'm talking this? More to show. So, um, a few names. Venemin uh, Vishnevsky is, now I don't consider as many of my countrymen do that Russia is, as we say, the motherhood of uh, elephants. But I really think that Vishnevsky was the best filmographer in the world of his time, although he did only Russian film history. Because in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, he did all the sorts of work filmographers do, started to do it basically in the 70s and 80s. Um, so he had index cards for every single Russian film, uh, which the all sorts of horrible handwriting, information from you know from the press. He interviewed everyone who was alive to get as much more demographical information as possible. He watched all the prints which existed for Russian cinema. He ended up publishing a catalog of uh, pre-revolutionary Russian films in 1945, which is still the best thing to have in early Russian cinema. Nothing is more consistent than this. 71 years ago. He even, those of you who are archivists may know this book, which is an excellent filmography of Soviet films, Soviet films, during the 1960s. It does not have Vishnevsky's name, which is a complete disgrace, because 95, well, okay, 75% of the material comes from his sources. And he even prepared a book in the 40s, which was never released. It's the only copy that we have. Whether the description of the filmography, including bad film, was very risky, those were shelved, and had information about the unfinished films and things like this. Um, he, is it, is it, do you see anything? No. Uh, could, could, could we maybe turn off the slide? Because the, I, I don't think my face really is important. <laughs> Let's look at the, the screen. It was, it was good when we were watching it. Just turn all, all of these, please. Better. Um, so uh, he was making biofilmographies of all filmmakers. Um, and he was collecting memoirs and recording memoirs of all of the living stars and directors of pre revolutionary Russian cinema, which was completely, well, almost forbidden by that time. So all that he managed to do in about 20 years. He died at the age of 54. And uh, still, when there is any kind of filmography in Russian film history, we're always using his sources. And I don't think that anyone in the world was consistent to such an extent in those days. Although even in Russia, he was not appreciated until, until recently. So, and he was, in the cinema fund, the head of the so-called Russian department. He was in charge of Russian films, of its storage, of, catalog, of uh, identification, of catalogs. So that's one name. Um, Another name is George Vinayus, who was the head of the um, foreign film collection. He did lots of things in film. He was even a film actor. Here he is playing a, uh, um, a clerk in a lost Ukrainian, a very like film, a very strange one. So um, he was the one who went, who assigned actually this little expedition to go to Germany and to take the collection of the Rice film machine. And thanks to this collection, um, well, at a certain point, the Southern one might have had the best collection of silent films in the world. Because it was not only the collection of, of the German film archive, but also of the French, and of the Czech, and of a few others. Some of it was later returned back to, uh, to Europe. And uh, um, so um, he was quite remarkable. I have no idea how in the world they identified foreign films back then. One of my tasks, as a little personal, uh, thing is to identify American silent films, which is not very easy because you have all those, you know, the digital media uh, 
uh, website and uh, all the catalogs and so forth. So when I was very proud of myself identifying about 20, 25 difficult cases, I found a little scrapbook by Benarius, which was unfinished because he died, um, I think he was eating an apple and he, and he choked. Very stupid death, very silly one. <laughs> I must admit it was, um, and um, so I found a little scrapbook and unfinished one. And out of this 25 films, he identified 21. But it was never finished, so nobody looked at the scrapbook. And you know, there was no internet and no access to foreign literature, so he must have been a genius. Uh, or he knew all the faces. Uh, he had a very strange uh, attitude to film. Sometimes the projectionist would um, um, play the film upside down, and instead of rewinding it, he would um, stand on his head, on his, on his head, and watch it upside. Of course, he was being eccentric, but he managed to watch the reel this way. So he was famous for that. People still remember him, by the way, which is very funny because, you know, the phone is a little village. So there are generations and generations of people working there. So many who are now in their, let's say, early 60s remember him when they were, when they were little kids. So that's, uh, that's him. Now comes Vera Kanjonkova, the wife of the first Russian producer, the widow, um, who was the only one who cared for the early Russian cinema because there was no such a name as Evgeny Bauer. He was a tasteless director of the past that still should be probably uh, thrown away. And she was the one who knew all the names, knew all the actors, and she identified everything and she went through every single reel. She did some harm, of course, because she, you know, she edited films from different negatives, whereas every pi pioneer in the archive world did. She had, you know, there was this wonderful festival in America, mostly lost, when they're showing unidentified fragments. Well, she did this in Russia in the 40s. Of course, not for the audience, for the veterans. She would invite all of her old friends who were all living in obscurity, sometimes in poverty. They would even get paid for this. And they would sit down in a room and watch the little fragments and identify the actors and uh, the sets, the film studio. It was quite remarkable. So if we have early Russian cinema, 75% of this is thanks to her. 25% of thanks to uh, Fia, because we got prints from other archives from Paris and Poland, first and foremost. So that's her. Uh, she was known as, uh, as the grandmother of Um So here's Pivata, we have been talking about him before. Um, so this is how the film of one brothers place looked back then. Um, a building was built for those who lived there. It was impossible to get from Moscow, it was too far away. And this is how a room of a typical archivist looked like in the 50s. See how narrow it is? A little radio, one chair, one table. And usually it was like a communal apartment. So one kitchen and four scholars or four families living together. One of them is now a very famous literary critic and uh, historian. He's in his late 80s. This photo is not from him. A good friend of Gabriel Garcia Marquez, by the way. So, um, this is the, some of the furniture from the, from the ice cream machine. And uh, of course, the chair was the reason the portrait was made. It was all a complete mess until the 60s or 70s. And it was like, you know, they were a little bit like uh, living after a bomb attack or something. All those heaps of reels in the corridors. Uh, so, that's one of the early scholars. They had this 9th century furniture, together with the bits and pieces of all German catalogs, which you can maybe see here on the shelf. You can read Ufami in one of them. Um, now we see still horses. This is the early 60s. And you see, everyone had to lead a social, 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 by social life. And there were elections um, to the Soviet, which were obligatory, but you had to go from one little, you know, country house to another one, and to make people vote for the, for the single party, and so everyone had to do this. This is the uh, researchers from the Stemma, from the curators, doing their sort of social duty. Another one was those, um, difficult to translate, the Russian word, Subotnik. So on Saturdays, about five or six times a year, 
he would have to go, go out and do some physical labor, which would be all kinds of social physical labor. And they tried to have fun in spite of, in spite of the difficulties. Building in danger. These are historians and archivists. And, uh, just keep in mind, so uh, people are always having tough life in an archive, but there is also always a nice way to follow. Um, not farmers. And so here is Vladimir Mitiev. Um, he came to the archive in 1962. He was 22 years old. Um, now he... Sorry. What is my next image? Just a second. Yeah. His father was a very famous historian of uh, theater, professor of, the, of, and of uh, Waterville and of circus, the main historian part of the circus. His legendary phrase, which is still quoted by many, is in his history of Russian circus, uh, at the beginning of a chapter. The, mid, the second half of the 19th century in Russia um, started under the slogan of uh, uh, horse circus. So he was talking about the circus, but this was, of course, applied to politics in general, to war. And so this was considered a very risky joke, which it was not. Uh, he was extremely active. I knew him. He died at the age of 97, I think. Unlike the son of Putin, who died too young. So, Dmitry uh, was from a very refined family, I would say. Here he is as a boy. Those who have seen him as an old man might be surprised. Quite different. Without beard yet. So, here is. Oh, still not beard. That's the Fiat Congress in Moscow, 1964. Um, that's him in the later years. That seemed to, he didn't really draw well, but he knew how to draw a self-portrait. <laughs> um, that's, that, that's what should be, that's the yeah, other, next story. Um, right. Um, so he was a critic, he wrote extremely well. He was fascinated by uh, Brigitte Bardot. He wrote a wonderful book about her, and it's a pity he didn't write a lot. His uh, uh, teacher, as he would always say, was uh, the head of the Belgian film archive, Jacques Ledoux. You probably have heard talk about him. He was completely fascinated by him when he visited the Seventh Fund during the First Fiat Congress, and they were, he was consulting him for the next several decades. Um, so, what did he do with this film account? Now, this is a different, interesting case. His main goal was not to do restorations, one of the preservations, people didn't mostly think about it. So if we're having this dichotomy of uh, Lindgren versus uh, Langlois, he was definitely the Langlois type. Um, he, as all of the Russian intelligentsia in the 60s and 70s, had no hope of normal foreign distribution in Russia. No chance of seeing Fellini, Bergman, Antonioni, Pasolini, whoever. Cobble later on. So the only way to do it was to get prints using all the ways possible and to show them in some strange circumstances. For example, there would be a conference on the physics of semiconductors. My grandmother was a physicist, so that's one of her memories. <clears throat> and as the fun part of the conference, they would show uh, Salo by Pasolini. I have a days of, 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 of Salo. <laughs> which was, of course, completely impossible to see in a normal legal screening, but this was a close thing. Well, the same was the conference of biologists for engineers, and biologists uh, had friends in other fields, they would bring them together, and so people ended up uh, by watching many of those films, which we had no chance of uh, seeing in Russia. You know, the last time of Paris, completely impossible. Uh, the, damned, the Damned by uh, Visconti. But Dmitry, uh, he actually was filling the gaps of the legal film industry. We had foreign films. We had some like it hot, we had Roman Holiday, we had some serious films, you know, um, the best years of our life, but still, we could never see Ninochka, for example, an anti Soviet film. So, um, sometimes he's being criticized for not paying enough attention to the nitrates. 
We lost lots of Russian Tintin, for example, or Tony, for not conducting proper restorations. That might be true. But he did the things which the Minister of Culture and the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and they all were supposed to do. All done by one man. Now, the ways were really quite eccentric. Years have passed, it is pretty well known, so maybe now we can give away some of the tricks. Uh, a story told by the late Peter van Bach, here in Bologna. So Dmitriev was certain that the film reform should have every important film, not only a masterpiece. So many of you probably have heard of a film called Deep Throat, right? A famous pornographic film from the 70s. Well, of course, pornography was completely impossible to get under any circumstances. So we had an arrangement. I don't know whether it was with Peter van Bach himself, he didn't mention it, or with somebody else. And they sent a film from this foreign archive to this film of Fond, and it was labeled Eisenstein Strike. <laughs> so this was a very typical case. Uh, a more blatant case. Uh, Dmitry, who started giving interviews, frankly, more or less, at the age of 70, and who said that I will never write my memoirs, because I will be imprisoned for a life sentence. <laughs> but he started telling things, and one of his motives was an archivist should have his morals, definitely, but they are very specific ones. Um, so, uh, suppose there was a film festival in Moscow. And at film festivals, you, you could have seen more. The last time when Paris was showing the film festival, at a very, very close screening. Of course, considered pornography by all Russian censors. So, um, while the last reels were screened, the first reels were rushed into a lab and a dupe nag was made. Um, well, why could we tell about this nowadays? First of all, because now we sort of respect the copyrights, we don't show these prints. Besides, the duplication was not done properly, of course. They were rushing. Usually black and white copies of color films. Who would ever want to screen them? But once again, since they had no hope whatsoever of opening the borders ever in their life, this was the only chance to make the film available for the Russian audience. For filmmakers, at least, so that they wouldn't be way behind the entire world. So, um, archivists from the West, the members, knew about those things. They would make fun of him sometimes, but never really criticize him. So this was the only way. Well, and besides, similar things happened in uh, other archives as well. Um, so, uh, that was one of his goals. Another goal was to save the band, the shelf films. And one of his ideas, one of his tricks, he was a great politician. You know, he was a member of the Communist Party. I, there were people in his generation who were actually very loyal and had, had some beliefs. He was not, he did not belong to that category. He was completely anti, mm -hmm. he was completely anti-Soviet, but it was the only way to get access to the authorities, and to have their eyes shut, let's say, for some of his activities. And uh, um, so uh, one of his um, ideas was, was, he was talking to, once a week, he would not go to Berlin School, he would stay in Moscow, and go from one official institution to another one, the Minister of Culture, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Goskino, like the Minister of Cinema, in a way, um, and talk to people and say with a very innocent look. You know, it is so smart of you not to uh, destroy the banned films. Because who knows what happens 10 years later? Maybe they have to be released and then you would be responsible for that. So it's a very good idea of you. And that's why the banned films are still there. And when the 80s and the 90s came, the banned films were released, and some very important ones. Like the complete version of uh, Andrei Rublo by Tarkovsky and many, many others. Well, starting with, of course, uh, the second part of I Was Terrible, before his base. Let's get by this film. Everyone was afraid that you know you ban it today is this bad, tomorrow it is good, so nothing was destroyed. Almost nothing. Although we did not keep, keep screen tests, unfortunately, mostly. We did not keep outtakes, all that came later. The notion of this was really important. Uh, another achievement which was criticized by many and praised by the others was the situation with the national collections. Because when the Soviet Union fell apart in 1991, many of the former republics, 
wanted their negatives uh, to be taken from Western Front. And one of the countries, well, I think I can name it by secret, Georgia, which once again has a great heritage, wanted their negatives. And Dmitry was completely fur furious, and he made a big scandal. I remember his interview when he said, I don't care if there is a, uh, there is a new war. You will not get the negatives. You will get all the copies you want, but the negatives should stay with us. A couple of years have passed, and Georgia, Georgian walls suffered two fires. Dmitriev was sardonically happy. <laughs> saying, see, what happens? Um, but as an excuse, you would always say, you know, the French have so many negatives of early Russian films, we don't want them back. Because if we start doing all this, monkeying around, this would never stop. Um, right, another thing, two more minutes maybe, is uh, the situation with the nitrates. Gustav Lafont is famous, or infamous, let's say, for destroying all the nitrates, which is not the case of the negatives. We kept the negatives, and we have some, they have some, way before my days, negatives back of the uh, foreign films. We had a camera negative of Le uh, Grande by Renoir, which was captured by the Germans from France, and which was sent from Gustav Lafont to Toulouse, which was at then the representative of France in FIA, because the uh, Francais was out of FIA for some time. Um, but Dmitry did a trick, which actually was revealed only after his death in Russia, although the people in the West knew about that. He would exchange nitric prints, nitric positives of foreign films with foreign archives, getting sometimes not quite legal copies of foreign films, Let's say from a country, country A would send films made by country B. And in return, he would send them the nitrates. And he would be killing two birds with one stone, getting the film frame possible to get, and saving the nitrates. And this is why there are nitrates from the from the Russian titles, several hundred, in many important archives. So this was not completely on purpose, and never discussed in any official meetings. Because we had to destroy the knife, this was the law. So, um, the very last thing which I want to say is, uh, just to give you a notion of how important cinema was to everyday life, here is one personal anecdote from Admitter's wife. Here she is. Um, I would say that here she looks like a very attractive young Russian woman. A very independent, he was working all the time and had, had his circle of friends, had her circle of friends. So once, uh, he would always buy her dresses, whenever he was the one who allowed to go abroad, right? And uh, he himself was always, had no taste for costumes or male costumes, but he would buy perfect dresses because he would see, watch new films, and he would predict the fashion. Um, so she was one of the most fashionable women in Moscow. And uh, once he came home and said, you know what, you should have a new haircut. I don't know how, you know, it's quite outrageous for a man to come up to his wife, who is quite pretty. She was like 25. I don't know how it's called, but to, to be dark hair is okay, straight hair, something like, like this. Anyway, there's this new actress, Anna Karina. Take a look. She went to the barber shop, well, to, the, to the hairdresser. And uh, said, well, no way, we only have five types of hairstyles. This is not one of them. <laughs> then she went to a children's hairdresser. Said, okay, if you want to make yourself ugly, go ahead. And so she was the only woman with a completely European look in Moscow. <laughs> For the time being. And this is not just anything about him. But film, foreign film especially, was actually the main window to the to the other world in Russia, and Mitchell realized that completely. So his idea of getting as many prints as possible, he tripled our collection during his 50 years, was not just, you know, teaching the film name to the filmmakers and showing the masterpieces, but actually making Russia much more Soviet Russia, not only Russia, the public, a much more open country, which he succeeded in. Because I think that uh, when he died, um, he was maybe one of the most influential and respected people in the whole film industry in Russia, considering all the actors and film directors. And that was thanks to that, because his role was completely acknowledged by everyone. 
Um, so, here's our picture. A very young matrix looking from a bus in the early 60s. A little bit up to here. Thank you.